You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the Rand Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from Rand's latest research and commentary. It's September 23rd. On Wednesday, Russian President Vladimir Putin called up hundreds of thousands of new troops and vowed to use, quote, all the means at our disposal against Ukraine and the West. This announcement came after Ukraine's triumphant counteroffensive in the eastern part of the country, where Ukrainian forces liberated significant amounts of territory and Russia suffered notable losses. Throughout the week, RAND researchers have been weighing in on these developments and have also been discussing other aspects of the ongoing conflict. Here's just a sample of what our experts had to say. On Twitter, Samuel Cherup wrote that Putin's message to Ukraine and the West is clear. He is raising the stakes and is unlikely to downsize the scope of his war. Dara Masico commented on the weaknesses of Russia's force mobilization system. They will not be able to do this well, she said of Putin's plan to call up new troops. Masako, an expert on Russian defense and security, believes that Moscow's forces will be at their weakest in the next 12 to 24 months. Quote, they will cobble together people and send them into the front with old training, poor leadership, equipment maintained in even worse shape than the active duty force, and send them in piecemeal because they don't have time to wait. In other words, Russia is muddling through. On the other side of the conflict, researchers John Gentile and Raphael Cohen wrote about Ukraine's stunning success in Kharkiv. In fact, the Battle of Kharkiv may even turn the tides of the war, providing operational and psychological advantages and a morale boost for the Ukrainian people. They compare this military achievement to the Continental Army's defeat of British forces in the Battle of Saratoga, a turning point of the Revolutionary War that ultimately led to American independence. Despite the momentum shift in Kharkiv, there are open questions about Ukraine's ability to sustain its gains on the ground. There are several factors to consider, says Rand's Alyssa Demas. While the will of the Ukrainian military remains incredibly strong, Ukraine depends on continued support from Western and NATO countries. This doesn't just mean providing military equipment, but also the will of the West to continue to stand behind Ukraine. Barry Pavel also noted how critical Western support is to Ukraine and raised the question of whether the U.S. and other countries might expand that support. I do think the Biden administration is, over time and slowly, opening the spigot in terms of capabilities, he said. Some of the things being considered were probably off the table earlier in the conflict. And although the West has repeatedly said that it is not seeking regime change in Moscow, William Courtney notes that America and its allies are taking measures similar to those that the West used to counter Soviet aggression in the 1980s. The formula used during the Cold War was arms, aid, sanctions, and ridicule. This approach may have helped usher in Russian liberalization then, and it could do so again, says Courtney. And finally, Kaylee Hurd emphasized the importance of protecting human security in Ukraine. Evidence of Russian war crimes, mass graves, illegal targeting of civilians, torture, and sexual abuse point to the risks that civilian populations would likely face during a renewed fight. The West and NATO should consider the support that Ukraine needs to address these risks and take steps to provide it, she says. For more insights from RAND experts on the war in Ukraine and our previously published research related to the conflict, visit www.rand.org slash Russia Ukraine. Even before Russia invaded Ukraine, intensifying competition with Russia in Europe, as well as with China in Asia, has led to calls for the U.S. to deprioritize a different part of the world, the Middle East. But according to a new RAND report, America has vital security interests there that should not be neglected. Here is the author's top 10 list of U.S. interests in the region. Number one, preventing terrorism. Terrorist groups in the region have degraded, but they still pose a serious threat. 
Number two, protecting global energy markets. Although the U.S. now relies less on energy from the Middle East, its allies still depend on it. Number three, dealing with the nuclear threat from Iran. If Iran gains nuclear weapons, then Saudi Arabia or Turkey could follow. Number four, keeping up with adversaries. The Middle East is an important theater for great power competition. Both Russia and China are trying to counter U.S. interests there. Number five, resolving regional conflicts and aggression. Civil wars and conflict in the Middle East spill over, straining the world order and affecting U.S. security. Number six, reducing the human toll. The historically militarized U.S. approach to the region has had high human and financial costs. Nearly all American military deaths in the past four decades have been in the Middle East. Number seven, strengthening governance and increasing economic opportunities. Weak rule of law and economic stagnation lead to chronic instability in the region, which spills over to the rest of the world. Number eight, addressing civilian displacement. The Middle East has had a greater proportion of its population displaced by violence than any other region in the world. This is harmful, destabilizing, and could create space for future radicalization. Number nine, mitigating the effects of climate change. The Middle East is the hottest and most water-poor region in the world. The regional effects of a warming climate will exacerbate other security challenges. Number 10, protecting the well-being of U.S. allies and partners in the region. The Middle East has one NATO ally, seven formally designated U.S. major non-NATO allies, and two major security partners. Additionally, the U.S. military has some kind of presence in at least 12 countries in the region. It is in America's best interest to maintain these strong relationships in the Middle East. Overall, RAND researchers recommend that Washington's Middle East policy going forward rely less on military operations and more on diplomacy, economic development, and technical assistance in the region. You can find the full report at RAND.org. Another new RAND study out this week looks at a serious domestic issue, substance use disorder and the potential barriers to treatment. Our study found that during the first year of the pandemic, admissions to drug treatment programs decreased by nearly 25%. The results show that all racial and ethnic groups experienced a drop in treatment admissions, but the largest decline was among Native Americans, followed by black people, Hispanic people, white people, and Asian individuals. More research might help explain what drove these racial and ethnic disparities, including the possible effects of bans on elective medical procedures, shelter-in-place orders, and other pandemic-related policies. But one thing is clear, the researchers say, the drop in drug treatment admissions is concerning, because there's also evidence that substance use disorder and rates of overdose death increased during the same period. Hurricane Fiona made landfall last week hammering the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, as well as other parts of the Caribbean. The storm left at least five people dead and a wake of damage and destruction before moving north. Fiona is the first major hurricane of the season. It comes almost exactly five years after hurricanes Irma and Maria devastated Puerto Rico. And the island was still recovering from that one-two punch before Fiona hit. RAND experts recently wrote about the need to improve America's reactive approach to disaster recovery. The current approach is not only expensive, they say, but it also adds years of painstaking work onto already long disaster recovery times. Recovering and rebuilding from major disasters can take well over a decade. And as more expensive disasters are occurring more often, it's becoming critical to reduce costs. RAND research, including research conducted to help Puerto Rico, has shown that rather than waiting for a disaster to strike and then spending billions to repair damages, the U.S. should focus on funding efforts that can reduce the level of damage that occurs in the first place. In other words, 
invest in resilience. For example, one study found that investing a dollar in mitigation efforts that aim to minimize the loss of life or property, such as installing flood control and water management systems, results in $6 of savings. Designing and implementing resilient building codes and construction standards can also help improve resilience. Our experts admit that investing a dollar today to save money tomorrow can be hard, especially for the government. But in the long run, it may be the affordable path forward in the face of climate change and the related rising costs of disasters. All students, especially students of color, benefit academically and socially from having teachers who are people of color. But people of color face systemic barriers to becoming teachers and staying in the profession. For example, people of color are more likely than their white peers to incur student debt. They might not have access to teacher role models who share their lived experiences, and they are more likely to work in challenging environments if they do become teachers. A new RAND report explores what it might take to address these issues and make America's teacher workforce more diverse. The authors offer a few key recommendations for state policymakers, districts, and schools. First, lower the cost of becoming a teacher and being a teacher. State policymakers could ensure that loan forgiveness and scholarship programs offer enough financial relief to be attractive. District leaders could also raise salaries, implement retention bonuses, or provide incentives to work in high-need schools or hard-to-fill positions. And teacher preparation programs could provide scholarships or stipends to participants. Second, take steps to ensure that the applicant pool is diverse. These might include training district and school staff to use hiring practices that mitigate racial bias, or adapting teacher training programs to intentionally consider and address the needs of teachers of color. Third, create an inclusive work environment to better retain educators. State policymakers could implement principal leadership standards that focus on developing positive collegial relationships, for example. And if they're not doing so already, district leaders could use in-service training for principals and teachers to provide concrete strategies on how to build inclusive school environments, and then incentivize the adoption of these strategies. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on today's episode, check the show notes at rand.org/podcast. We'll see you next week.